Psalm chapter 66, beginning in verse 1. Shout joyfully to God all the earth. Sing about the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. All the earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name. Shalom. Come and see the wonders of God. His acts for humanity are all inspiring. He turned the sea into dry land and they crossed the river on foot. There we, were, we rejoiced in Him. He rules forever by His might. He keeps His eye on the nations. The rebellious should not exalt themselves. Praise our God, you peoples. Let the sound of His praise be heard. He keeps us alive and does not allow our feet to slip. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. You lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you broke us out to abundance. I will enter your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke during my distress. I will offer you fatted sheep as burnt offerings with the fragrant smoke of rams. I will sacrifice oxen with goats. Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth, and praise was on my tongue. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. May God be praised. He has not turned away my prayer or turned his faithful love from me. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've been following along with us as we are uh, reading through the Bible together a chapter at a time uh, during the week and on the weekends we're going through Psalms. You may recognize that this Psalm is one that um, we had as our reading for yesterday. And I really enjoy this Psalm. It reminds me of several great things about our God. There in verse 3, look there again please. Say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. Your enemies will cringe before you because of your great strength. And we are reminded that our God is mighty and powerful. And no enemy can stand before him. We're reminded of when Jesus went to confront the Gadarene demoniac. The demons possessing the man cried out, what do you have to do with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? The devil and his boys knew their time was limited. They now know who sits on the throne. For God has already kicked them out of heaven and one day he'll kick them out of earth as well. Our enemies cower before God. That's why Paul was able to say in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, If God is for us, who can be against us? Our God is great, and his enemies cringe before him. Second, we're reminded, look there again, if you will, please, in verse 6. He turned the sea into dry land, and they crossed the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him. We're reminded that our God is quite capable and quite able to do miraculous things on behalf of his people. I remember a number of years ago I had the opportunity to go and teach in Russia for a couple weeks. And they told us when we came in that uh, on the plane they said they handed out slips of paper and asked people to fill them out saying how much money they were bringing into the country. I didn't get one of those and didn't realize what an oversight that was. Until halfway during my stay, I was talking to the missionary. He said, you, you got your slip of paper, right, saying how much money you brought into the country? I said, no, I didn't get one. He said, what? You have to have one of those in order to leave. I said, what do you mean? He said, just what I said. They're not going to let you leave without one of those slips of paper saying how much money you brought into the country because they want to make sure that you leave with less currency that you than you came in with. Well, I called Gladys. Now, some of y'all my age or older remember back in the days when phone calls were quite expensive. At that particular time, phone calls from Russia to the United States cost you six cents a minute. I mean, I'm sorry, six dollars a minute. Uh, we had a sixty-dollar conversation. Never have I valued conversation with my wife more than I did on that night. And Gladys and I were talking, I said, baby, uh, 
they said that they were supposed to give me a slip when I came into the country I didn't get it and they told me I can't leave without it <laughs> she said what <laughs> now mind you we'd only been married about five months we were still in the newlywed phase she still missed me and the idea of me being gone for a while did not overly please her I said yeah they said they won't let me leave unless I have one of these when they get to the airport she said what are you going to do I said you're going to pray and that's what I'm going to do and we got to the airport I got to the airport came time for me to leave walking through customs and all of that kind of stuff they never asked me for that paper Amen. never asked me what money I brought in or how much I was carrying out I was never stopped I was never questioned man I don't know how long y'all sung the hallelujah chorus before but I sang it for quite a while on the flight back Tom Edgum I was fortunate when I was a, a youth I went up to a Lookout Mountain in Tennessee and that week that I was there they had Tom Edgum come and speak and lead the youth conference Tom used to smuggle Bibles into Russia he was talking about miraculous times that God had worked he said one time he was going through customs he had a suitcase full of Bibles and did not know what he was going to do he said each of the people in the line in front of them as they came to the customs officer they asked them if they had any pornographic or religious literature on them he said one after another they responded no he said I didn't know what I was going to do when I got up there I was a Christian could not lie he said the person right in front of me they asked him do you have any pornographic or religious material with him and the person said no Tom said I was next I got up to the table and they asked me do you have any fruits or vegetables in your suitcase <laughs> God can do miraculous things on behalf of his people we're reminded also look there again if you will please in verse 19 however God has oh I'm sorry verse 10 and for you God tested us you refined us as silver is refined you lured us into a trap you placed burdens on our backs you let men right over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out to abundance. We were reminded that when we get off the trail, when we get off the path, sometimes the Lord will allow us to go through difficult times. As a matter of fact, sometimes He will arrange difficult times to bring us back to our senses, to cause us to realize and to remember how important our relationship with Him is supposed to be and what a priority it's supposed to be in our lives and the consequences that disobedience and rebellion will bring into our lives. We remember that God allows testing before victory. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 19. However, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. May God be praised. He has not turned away from my prayer or turned his faithful love from me. We're reminded in this passage that God answers prayers. He is a, a miracle working God who often works in response to the prayers of his people. I remember years ago, Gladys, uh, when she and I were married and she moved into the parsonage that I was living in at the time. It was a double wide trailer in northwest Tennessee. In many places in the house, the only thing between me and the ground was the carpet over the holes in the floor. Uh, kind of a rough place. The first year I was there, I trapped 19 mice uh, in the traps in the winter time when they all tried to move into where it was warm. The second year, I trapped 21. Shortly after Gladys and I were married, she woke me up because there was a noise in the wall at the head of our bed. She said, what is that? I said, that's just the mice. Don't worry about it. I pounded on the wall to make them shut up long enough for me to go back to sleep. However, that pounding did not work on my wife. She said, oh, no, we're not going to go like that. I came in a short while later and found my wife praying about mice. I said, baby, 
are you actually praying about mice? She said, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And I'm not going to get to heaven and find out I had mice in my house because I didn't pray about it. My wife started praying about mice. We started finding dead mice all over the place. We found a family of mice dead in our backyard, suitcases in their hand, walking toward our house, laying dead in the yard. Because the preacher had a wife who prayed about mice. We have a prayer answering God. A miracle working God who works in response to the prayers of His people. God answers prayer. But look there again with me if you will please verse 18. If I had been aware of malice in my heart the Lord would not have listened. Now in the midst of all of the rejoicing and the celebration about what a great and, and mighty and awesome God, what a praiseworthy God we have, we are reminded in the midst of this that there are conditions to answer prayer. And that there are times when God may not answer our prayers. There are times when even though God is greater than our enemies, He will not answer prayer. There are times when even though God can and frequently does miracles for His people, He will not answer our prayers. As a matter of fact, in our readings in Jeremiah this week and last, we have encountered God saying three different times that He will not answer prayers. Now, if God is a loving God, and He is, and if God is an all-powerful God, and He is, and if God's enemies fear him and they do then why does he sometimes choose not to answer our prayers this morning I would like to look at several reasons number one look there again with me if you will in verse 18 if I had been aware of malice in my heart the Lord would not have listened my friends I want you to understand that unconfessed sin can cause your prayers to go unanswered. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2. The Bible says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. The Bible tells us that it is the Holy Spirit who guides our praying. And how in the world will he do that when we have quenched the Spirit by having unconfessed sin in our lives? Unconfessed sin can cause your prayers to go unanswered. And I want you to understand, my friends, that can also mean that you have no relationship with the Lord in the first place. In John chapter 14, verse 11, we read, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, He is under no obligation and no responsibility at all to listening to, much less answering your prayers. No matter how flowery you say it, no matter how many church terms you throw in there, no matter how many scripture passages you quote, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, He is under no compunction, no obligation at all to even listening to your prayers much less answering them. Remember when the sons of the priest tried to cast the demon out of that man? They commanded the demon, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, come out. And the demon answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then he proceeded to take those seven sons, strip them naked, and chase them down the street. Not exactly the way they planned on things turning out. My friend, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if He is not your Lord and Savior, there is right now unconfessed and undealt with sin in your life. And that can cause your prayers to be unanswered. Second, praying for something you know is not God's will can keep your prayers from being answered. Save your places. Turn with me, please, to Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 16. A few pages to your right. As for you, 
Do not pray for these people. Do not offer a cry or a prayer on their behalf. And do not beg me, for I will not listen to you. Turn over to chapter 11, Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 14. As for you, do not pray for these people. Do not raise up a cry or a prayer on their behalf. For I will not be listening when they call out to me at the time of their disaster. Did God tell Jeremiah not to pray for these people? This is the audience participation portion of our service. Did God tell Jeremiah not to pray for these people? Yes. Now, if Jeremiah was to continue to pray for these people, is God going to answer his prayers? No. no. Because he is doing something, praying for something that he knows is contrary to God's will. Jeremiah knew God's will in this situation. He knew what the Lord planned to do. So the Lord told him, don't even bother praying for these people because people, I'm not going to listen to you. And my friend, if you know God's will, if you know what He wants you to do, don't bother praying something different because He's already told you what His plan is. He's already told you what He wants you to do and how He's going to work this out. Don't go praying, asking God to do something different. He said, you know my will. Praying for something you know that's not God's will can keep your prayer from being answered. Number three, praying against the con consequences of our sin will often keep your prayers unanswered. Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 14. Look there with me if you will. As for you, do not pray for these people. Do not raise up a cry or a prayer on their behalf. For I will not be listening when they call out to me at the time of their disaster. I will not be listening when they cry out to me at the time of their disaster. These folks have been living in rebellion for years. God sent the prophet Jeremiah and others to warn them and tell them, get rid of the sin, get rid of the abomination in your midst, get rid of the rebellion in your life, turn back to me. And again and again and again they refused. Oh, they went even further than that. Look there if you will. Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 19. For I was like a docile lamb fled to led to slaughter. I didn't know that they had devised plots against me. Let's destroy the tree with its fruit. Let's cut him off from the land of the living so that his name will no longer be remembered. When God sent a prophet to tell them the truth, to tell them what he wanted done, they did everything that they could to get rid of him. As a matter of fact, they plotted his death. It breaks my heart when I've seen in church after church people settled in their ways, settled in their rebellion, happy with the way things are going. You have a preacher come in and begin to try to share with them the Word of God and the things of God. The preacher doesn't usually end up staying in that church very long. Because folks don't want to listen to someone telling them the truth when they're living in a life of rebellion. Oh, they didn't stop there. Look there again. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 24. Therefore, here's what the Lord uh, verse 21, Therefore, here's what the Lord says concerning the people of Ananoth who want to take your life. They warn, you must not prophesy in the name of Yahweh or you will certainly die at our hand. They wanted to get rid of him. Number two, they said, don't tell us those things. We don't want to know the truth. We don't want to know what God says. We don't want to know what God's expectations are. We don't, want, we don't want to know how He wants us to live or to walk or to guide or the priorities that He has in our life. They threatened to get rid of the one telling them the truth. Then they came to Him and said, Shut up. We don't want to hear it. Don't tell us what God says. And then third, Jeremiah chapter 14 verse 11. Look there with me if you will please. Jeremiah chapter 14. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, Do not pray for the well-being of these people. If they fast, I will not hear their cry of despair. 
If they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I will not accept them. Rather, I will finish them off by sword, famine, and plague. And I replied, Oh no, Lord God, the prophets are telling them you won't see sword or suffer famine. I will certainly give you true peace in this place. But the Lord said to me, These prophets are prophesying a lie in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, worthless divination, the deceit of their own minds. They threatened the preacher that was telling the truth. They told him to preach something else. And then when he refused to do so, they began to surround themselves with prophets that would tell them God only wanted to make them happy and healthy and wealthy. That God is some kind of cosmic Santa Claus sitting in heaven waiting to grant you your every wish. They surrounded themselves with people who would tell them that God loves you just like you are. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to have certain priorities. You don't have to have certain goals in your life. God loves you. And in the end, it'll all work out. These people didn't want to know the truth. They threatened the preacher who told them the truth and surrounded themselves with liars who told them God only wanted to make them happy and they could live any way they wanted to without penalty or punishment. And then when judgment came, they prayed God would take it away. And God said, look, y'all put on your big boy britches because there's a whole bunch of hurt fixing to come your way. King David did that. He sinned with Bathsheba. Stole another man's wife. Then when she became pregnant, he had her husband killed to cover his sin. The Lord sent a prophet to David and said, David, there's going to be a terrible punishment. There's going to be a terrible penalty. Your family is going to suffer because of your disobedience and rebellion. And the child that you and Bathsheba are about to have is going to die. David began to cry and he began to fast and he began to pray. He said, Lord, no, don't do this. You see, David was upset about the consequences of the sin. And the Lord did not answer his prayers. And don't we sometimes do that? Don't we sometimes sin and then ask God to keep us from suffering the consequences of our decisions? Lord, I, I, I bought this new car a while back because I really wanted a new car. I needed a bigger TV and those new shoes look great on me. Now I'm having a little trouble making the payments. Will, will you uh, help me with this? Uh, Lord, I know we're not married, but please bless our home. Uh, Lord, I know that my sexual practices haven't been exactly according to your plans, but please don't let me get pregnant or get a disease. Uh, Lord, I, I know I haven't been taking a day of rest like you've told us to worship and to rest and to remember who and what's really important. But please, keep me healthy. We met a man like that yesterday. He went a year without a day off and several years with no vacations and now not much more than 60 finds his health falling apart. Lord, I know I've been angry and bitter a lot of my life and I've held grudges and I haven't turned the other cheek or overlooked offenses like you've told us to. But please let my children and family still want to be around me. Don't leave me alone and lonely. Lord, I know I've done this and I'm doing this. But please don't let me suffer the con consequences of what I'm doing. Galatians chapter 6 verses 7 and 8 Paul writing to the church in Galatia says be not deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Praying against the consequences of your sin will often cause your prayers to go unanswered. Fourth, sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers because He's got something better planned. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. Look there with me if you will please. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 4. 
the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests living in Ananoth in the territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, king of Ammon, king of Judah. It also came throughout the days of Jehoiakim, son of Joash, uh, Josiah, king of Judah, until the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, oh no, Lord God. Look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. Lord came to Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, I'm going to use you as a prophet. Jeremiah began praying. <laughs> uh, Lord, this ain't exactly what I planned for my life. Do you know what I just got my degree in? Do you know how long my parents have saved to send me to school? Lord, I already have my career planned out. I already know what I'm going to do and where I'm going to do it. And Lord, this prophet stuff, that doesn't fall anywhere in my plans. Uh, here I am, send my brother. And God said, mm -mm. No, uh, I'm going to use you as a prophet. And I know you had these plans and these things that you wanted to do. But I got something better planned for you. I'm going to make your name a household name in every home in the land. I'm going to have a, a book recorded in your name, placed in my holy book, so all mankind throughout all history will know about you. Jeremiah, I have something better planned for you than what you and your parents have planned out and laid out for your life. Jeremiah, you can beg me and cry and plead and do all of that stuff that you want to, but I'm not answering your prayer. Because I have something better planned out. Sometimes the Lord doesn't answer our prayers because He has something better planned. I don't know about you, but I prayed about several women before Gladys and I were married. And each time the Lord said no. He had something better planned. He had a help meet. A partner in ministry and a best friend waiting for me. He said, Gene, I know you're praying about this and I know that you've been waiting. But I got something better planned. And you won't believe what I have waiting for you. Ruth Graham the now deceased wife of Billy Graham once said she was grateful the Lord didn't answer all of her prayers or she would have married the wrong man several times. Don't you know Joseph prayed to get out of the pit? Don't you know that he prayed to be able to get out of slavery and ask the Lord to let him go home? But all the while God would not answer because God had something better planned. You get on Interstate 40 on the East Coast and head west. You'll have no problem. There'll be some potholes in the road and an awful lot of traffic. But I-40 will do just fine until you get to Memphis, Tennessee, and then it stops. <laughs> you take I-240 around Memphis, and on the other side of the city, you will find that I-40 is there as well. But there's no connection. I-40 stops and I-40 ends. Dr. Adrian Rogers, pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church, used to pastor the church when it was on Bellevue Boulevard, downtown Memphis. And you see, there were a lot of people that didn't want to have to move the zoo and didn't want land cleared through a forest for the interstate. And Dr. Rogers said, I used to pray about them people all the time. God, do you see what they're doing? There's a whole bunch of people on the east side of Memphis that want to be able to get to this church easily and they can't because all these people are standing in the way. God, you need to get them. <laughs> and he said, I prayed that way for years. And finally the courts decided I-40 would not go through Memphis. It would be a truncated interstate stopping and starting again. Well, over time, Bellevue Baptist Church became uh, land bound. It was outgrowing the property that it had. 
And they ended up moving out east of Memphis and building a new facility there. About that time, the city and the state began selling up all of the property that they had bought up for the construction of the interstate through Memphis. And all of a sudden, they had some extra money, some of which they used to build a new off-ramp, an on-ramp, right there by the new church, Bellevue Baptist Church, that had located out of town. Dr. Rogers said, all that time that I had been praying God would put it through, he had something better waiting. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we pray them because He has something better planned. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we want Him to because He is protecting you. Now it pains me to admit this, but to those of you who know me, it will come as no surprise. There have been occasions when I have been known to speed just a little bit. Uh, there have been occasions when I would drive on Enterprise Osteen Road down there because I knew there were no traffic lights, I knew there was no traffic, I could make better time down there. There have been times while driving on that road I have been trapped behind somebody who drove the speed limit or less and I have talked to the Lord on occasion about those people. Lord, you know I am running late and I really need to get where... It's not my fault, God. You know the cow knocked over the feed. I had to fix the water. It's not my fault. Lord, you really need to get these people out of my way. And I will talk to him about these inconsiderate people that go out of their way to get in my way and cause me issues. And on more than one occasion, right around the next curve, I have found a gentleman of Kevin's persuasion sitting on the side of the road running radar waiting for this impatient preacher and me and the Lord have had uh, other prayer meetings oh Lord God thank you you are so wise I appreciate you protecting me sometimes the Lord doesn't answer our prayers because he's protecting us protecting us from our willful ways protecting us from making decisions or choices that he knows that in the long run will not be to our benefit. There are other reasons we could find in the Bible why God doesn't answer our prayers. We may not be ready. I was much older than I intended to be when I finally convinced Gladys to marry me. And I had prayed about marriage for a long time. I was a single preacher for a while. I said, Lord, you know it sure would be a lot easier to pastor if I had a wife. There are situations I can't minister in and, and there are people who will not listen because I do not have a partner and, and they believe I do not understand. Lord, it sure would be easier if I had a wife. But you know, if he'd given me a wife any sooner than he did, I would not have appreciated the gift that he gave me. Sometimes the Lord doesn't answer our prayers the way that we want and when we want because we are not ready. He has to do a work in our lives and in our hearts. He has to open our eyes and grant us understanding. Many reasons why the Lord does not answer our prayers. Now, if God is all powerful and He is, and if God loves us, and He does, and if God is a heavenly father and loves to bestow gifts on his children and the Bible tells us that he does. And yet we pray and God does not answer our prayers. What should we do? Number one, you check for sin in your life. Say, so Lord, is there something in my life that's not pleasing to you? Something that you've told me to deal with. An attitude. A bitterness. An area of disobedience or rebellion. Lord, is there something in my life that I need to deal with? You pray and you ask for the Lord's guidance. If He shows you those things, you get those confessed. You deal with those. Number two, you keep on praying. Don't you dare stop. You keep 
home pray. Third, you trust the Lord to work it out. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are called according to His purposes. If you do not understand, but you know that God is good. And God is loving and God is merciful. And you know that you have a relationship with that Heavenly Father. You trust God to work it out. Not in His time, not in our timing, but in His. Knowing that He is working for our good and according to His plans and purposes. And fourth, you continue to praise. Because God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good.